On May 21, 1945, at a checkpoint in northern Germany, a group of former Soviet prisoners of war captured three German soldiers trying to escape. Among these, there was one with a shaved head and an eye patch that caught the attention of the soldiers. His documentation identified him as Sergeant Heinrich Hetzinger. The German prisoners passed through different camps during the following days until they were taken to civil interrogation camp number 31, near Lüneburg. There, British Captain Thomas Sylvester began routinely questioning the sergeant, when Hitzinger finally removed his eye patch, Don Small, circular glasses and asked to speak to either American general like Eisenhower or Britain Montgomery. Before Sylvester's astonished look, he revealed his true identity, his name was Heinrich Himmler. If this was true, Allied officials had on their hands the most wanted Nazi leader after Hitler's suicide. Himmler had been a central figure in the Nazi party since its inception and even during the last months of the war he had played a leading role in the fight against the Soviets. However, the imminent fall of the Third Reich turned Himmler into an erratic and incompetent man who tried to negotiate a belated peace with the Allies and ended up being declared a traitor by Hitler himself. How were the last weeks of this Nazi leader? Don't leave your screen because in the next few minutes we'll tell you everything about the end of Heinrich Himmler. Are you ready? Let's get started. Himmler's importance in the Third Reich cannot be underestimated. Since he was appointed as Reichsführer SS in 1929 he grew the Nazi forces, which initially numbered only a battalion of 290 men, but quickly multiplied by the thousands under Himmler's rule. During World War II, the Reichsführer SS, renowned for his great organizational skills, directly oversaw the creation of the concentration camps and the Holocaust, basically directing the mass murder of millions of people. Simultaneously, he filled his role as head of the SS and played a leading role in the Wehrmacht's advance into Eastern Europe. However, in 1945, the situation was radically different. The Third Reich found itself increasingly hemmed in by the advances of the United States from France and the Red Army in the East. After failing to stop the Americans as Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Upper Rhine in January 1945, Himmler was appointed Commander-in-Chief again, this time of Army Group Vistula, with the aim of stopping to the Soviet Union that was relentlessly approaching Berlin. In retrospect, Hitler's decision proved to be wrong. Himmler did not have sufficient military experience to face a mission of such importance. At the same time, this loyal Nazi dignitary grew less and less convinced of Nazi Germany's ability to win the war. However, he obeyed his orders and established his command center at Schneidermal, using his special train, the Sonderzug Steiermark, as its headquarters. During these weeks of feudal planning, Himmler began to behave more and more erratically. He rarely left his train, which was far from being properly equipped for the mission, since it only had a telephone line and no proper maps or radio to communicate with the front. Himmler also showed little interest in work in general, seeing it as a futile endeavor. He worked only four hours a day and only after receiving a massage every morning that was followed by lunch and a long nap. The lack of leadership was evident in the performance of the German army on the Eastern Front. On April 20, with the imminent fall of the Third Reich very close, Himmler met Hitler for the last time in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, to celebrate the Führer's birthday. Although Himmler swore allegiance to his leader to the end, this was far from the truth. In fact, since the arrival of spring, he had been negotiating peace with the Allies behind Hitler's back. Just one day after the Führer's birthday, Himmler met with Norbert Masser, the Swedish representative of the World Jewish Congress, to agree on the liberation of several concentration camps. Seeking to save himself, the Nazi leader brazenly stated that the gas chambers were only used to burn the corpses of victims of typhus epidemics and that the percentage of survivors in Auschwitz was very high, despite the fact that the camp had already been liberated and that the Allies knew of the atrocities committed by the Nazis there although perhaps not the true scale. Days later, Himmler met with the president of the Swedish Red Cross, Folke Bernadotte, informed him that Hitler would be dead in the next few days and asked him to contact Dwight Eisenhower to discuss the terms of the German surrender. Although Himmler tried to keep this entire negotiation secret, 
on April 28, a BBC bulletin broke the news. Hitler, feeling betrayed by whom he considered his second most loyal supporter after Goebbels, exploded into a rage. He declared him a traitor and dismissed him from the Nazi party and all charges against him. Just two days later, the Führer would commit suicide in his bunker, just as Himmler had promised the Allies. However, Eisenhower completely repudiated the belated peace proposal and declared Himmler Nazi Germany's greatest war criminal. The once extremely powerful Nazi leader stood alone at the end of the war, totally doomed, considered a traitor by the new German administration of Admiral Karl Donitz and as the most wanted man by the Allies. Out of options, Himmler fled to Flensburg in northern Germany, where he hid for days. On May 20, as the Allies closed in on the city, he, along with a small group of German soldiers, attempted a desperate escape. He shaved off his trademark mustache, removed his glasses, shaved his head, and donned an eye patch. Wearing military police uniforms, they tried to escape to the south, but the escape plan was cut short just two days later when they were detained by former Soviet prisoners. After revealing his real name to reach an agreement with the major of the detention camp, Himmler was taken to the doctor for tests to confirm his identity. While doing the routine, the doctor noticed a black object in the lower jaw of the Nazi criminal. He immediately tried to remove it, but was unsuccessful. Himmler bit into the cyanide capsule and seconds later, he dropped dead, despite vain attempts at resuscitation. Shortly after, he was buried in an undisclosed location in Lüneburg. He was survived by his family, including his daughter Gudrun Berwitz, who dedicated herself to following in her father's footsteps in National Socialism and even denied the Holocaust and maintained that her father, the great Heinrich Himmler, had not committed suicide, but had been killed. Beyond this, all the information and studies conclude that the official version is true and that one of the great responsible for so much death and destruction left this world without facing trial and punishment for his actions. We come to the end of the video and we want to ask you, do you think that, if they had chosen another commander-in-chief other than Himmler, the Third Reich would have had a chance to stop the Red Army or was it already doomed? Leave your answer in the comment box below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history. Thank you very much for joining us until the end. And stay tuned for our next video.